Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Friday live stream. I mean, we have so many good news articles to go over. Let's just jump right into it. Actually, before we jump right into it, let me just say one thing. And that is that I try to give you a balanced stories to not give you too much hype and not, you know, send you over the edge and go, everything's going to go up forever because it's not. But these stories and the things that are happening today make it very hard to do that. So here's what we have. The market itself is doing fantastic. Uh, there's only a way to say that. I think we all know that. We've checked our portfolio probably 10 times today. Don't lie to me. I know you have. And uh, we can see that, I mean, Bitcoin is teetering on all-time highs continuously. And over 30 days, it's looking pretty good. But there's some big movers in the last 24 hours. And a couple of those big movers are, number one, Cardano at 14.5% in a 24-hour time period. And we talked about this because it is now a layer two solution on Bitcoin and is using what's called the Bitcoin OS, the Bitcoin operating system. We covered this like a week ago. And the question was, why isn't the price moving? Sometimes it just takes a little while for people to figure this all out. But congratulations, Cardano holders, because you know what? You earn it. And then there's some other, there's one more big one down here. And if I can just find it, that's it. Polygon at 12.8%. Again, another laggard. That really hasn't done too much, but there's a specific reason why, and it has to do with PayPal, which we'll get to in a second. But the title of this whole video was Retail is Back. Retail is coming back. I'm not saying it's back totally, because if it was back totally, I'd have a bunch of people in the comment section calling me Dan and not Rob. But if you take a look here, this is Google searches. And I just put in a search term, Bitcoin. And uh, if you can do it, and this is this is Google Trends. This is not telling you the exact hits or the amount that uh, people are actually searching for, but it's like trends over time. So a score of 100 would mean, if it would ever go up here, this is 100, just trust me, in 2021, this would mean this is the most interest and the most amount of searches for Bitcoin in the last five years, which was roughly, there it is, May 16th to May 22 of 2021. What was happening right there? Well, after the all-time highs, in April, then all the normies started to say, hey, what's about this Bitcoin thing as it was going down? And it cratered, and then people lost interest, as you can see right here. And then, of course, it goes up in November, and then people start searching for it again, <laughs> which is, that's just how people invest. Can't help that. But today, and you can see that over time, it's been pretty flat, 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 flat. But look at this. So here we are, Bitcoin at 17, October 20th. People couldn't figure out why, what the heck is going on. There's some good things happening. But then just a week, now we're at 36. That's quite a big jump from 18 or 17 to 36. That interest isn't, of course, at the all-time high, but I expect it to go much higher. And the reason for that is numerous. One of those, of course, is ETFs. ETFs are doing quite well. Total net flows as far as yesterday. You had BlackRock. And I believe there was a, a leaked memo which talked about from BlackRock who is stating that they are going to be, quote, unquote, doubling down on the Bitcoin ETF. Don't quote me. The source is just trust me. This is just a thing that I heard from secondhand, and of course it's on X, so who knows if it is. But it seems like uh, BlackRock is in no short supply of pushing Bitcoin onto their customers. Also, Fidelity did a little bit of in inflows, BitB, HODL, Grayscale Bitcoin Mini, but the total net flows is pretty good. And again, we are at all-time highs, not just for the price, but for the Bitcoin flows. So there is that. That's good news. like to see that. But what's more interesting to me is the market cap that we were taking away from other different hard assets. And one of those would be gold. BlackRock's Bitcoin's ETF is officially bigger than its gold ETF. Now, gold's been around for thousands of years. I hold gold in my Roth IRA account. I have no problems with gold or silver. But again, remember, I thought it was 12 trillion of, of the amount that was actually in this asset class for gold. It's not. It's $18 trillion. I did not know that until like four days ago. So that's obviously because the price has appreciated and it's hit all-time highs as well. If we could just dig more into that, into gold, and it's inevitable, it is inevitable, I believe, that it's going to happen, that uh, you take another 5% or 10% of that, Bitcoin starts to hit over six figures. So I, again, see some pretty good things happening on the horizon, but nobody's got a crystal ball. We'll see. And, you know, things are going so well. Even the ETH ETF had a bunch of inflows uh, the last couple of days. Now, overall, the net flows of the Bitcoin, or excuse me, the Ethereum ETF is 410 million negative, meaning people are selling. Who's selling? Grayscale. Grayscale dumped like crazy. Grayscale also dumped like crazy on the Bitcoin ETF, but the difference was there was a heck of a lot more interest. And this is not to say that Ethereum is dead. It's not. It's actually done quite well. 
But on the ETF itself, the institution is saying, yeah, we don't get it yet. However, BlackRock, Fidelity, and Bitwise, well, Black, yeah, BlackRock, Fidelity, and Bitwise just had a, quite a bit of an inflow, and there's been no outflows for, what, three days? We'll see what happens on the fourth. So, you know, we'll see what happens with Ethereum. Things are looking much better. But this was the thing that got me today as I was perusing just around in uh, Twitterverse. John Reed Stark. I, uh, if you don't know John Reed Stark, uh, he's a former, I believe he was part of the SEC at one point. And uh, he is a, a staunch critic of cryptos and digital assets. Uh, this was just from September 30th, just to give you kind of an overview of who John Reed Stark is and what he believes in. And someone said that he's like uh, Don Quixote chasing windmills. He goes, thanks, thanks, buddy. Thanks, my friend. You may be right. I may indeed be Don Quixote choosing, chasing windmills. But if I can, and this is a direct quote from him on his X page, which I have no problem with. But if I can deter one investor from buying into all this crypto nonsense, it will still all be worth it. Let's see how that works out in the long run. And then this is the next one from 730. And he says, yes, yet another SEC crypto DAO victory, a settled action. So again, John is no fan of us, of not of us, of, of the investments into crypto. We'll just say that. And this was a X spaces where he came out and just said, yeah, the SEC is done. And it's about, it's actually an hour and 42 long, two minutes long. Uh, I listened to it. Uh, you can, I tried to link in the, in the uh, description, but there's something going on with Google today. I can't seem to place things in there. I don't know if it's the browser or whatever else, but um, if you can just search for John Reed Stark, you can listen to that hour and 42 minute thrilling, thrilling X spaces. But essentially what he says is this. He's like, they have to stop down. They have to step down. They have to stop. They're not going to be able to pursue anything. And the different cases that are actually already in progress will be stopped because of the fact that uh, you got Gary Gensler as the chair, and we can't continue on that same path. On top of that, he talks about how Mark Ueda, uh, who is one of the uh, commissioners, he's, he believes that he will be uh, the next uh, SEC chair. And let me, be, let me be very clear. And that is Gary Gensler himself was a horrible chairperson. It wasn't because he was bad with crypto. He's bad with everything. I mean, so far. And this beautifully depicts essentially what he has protected us from, staking with Kraken. But then all the bank failures and all the things and his buddy S S Sam Bankman-Breed, or Sam Bankman-Breed, Sam Bankman-Breed, SBF and FTX, is that collapse and Blackfly and Blackfly and Celsius, did a hor horrible job of protecting users. So he should step aside. For the good of the country, I urge Gary, which I'm sure he's not a fan of the show, to step down. For the good of the country, I think you owe it to us. Please go away. And on top of that, I don't know if, if it's going to be Mark Ueda or if it's going to be Hester Pierce who's going to be the next uh, commissioner, but one of those two will come in. No, um, as I understand it, Donald Trump cannot fire Gary Gensler, but uh, he can appoint another chair in his place, and then Gary could hang around if he really wanted to. But this is who the Donald Trump administration has already reached out to. Looks like Robin Hood legal boss, Robin Hood which, as you may have remembered, uh, did integrate crypto into their trading platform, is being, consider is being considered for the SEC chair, chair shortlist. And I was like, why? Why? This is why. So U.S. President-elect Trump's transition team is reportedly considering Robin Hood Market's legal battle for a shortlist of candidates. Dan Gallagher, Robin Hood's chief legal compliance and corporate affairs officer, who was a Republican SEC commissioner. I did not know that from 2011 to 2015 under the Obama administration. Very Democrat. I mean, Democrat. Obama, Democrat. And Trump reaches out to him and says, yeah, let's do it. So, hey, at least there is uh, bipartisan support, I suppose. And it's currently the Trump team's front runner to replace SEC chair Gary Genzer. Now look, I don't know if he's gonna be worse than Gary Genzer or if he's gonna be better than Gary Genzer, but I don't think he can be much worse as far as for crypto. So hopefully this works out, but uh, the times they are a change and I see good things uh, moving forward. But there is something that does concern me, which is this, it's gonna be the, a natural exuberance and it makes sense, right? And it's because 
when the price starts going up and we hear all this good news, you don't hear as much bad news. And there's gonna be this, this natural ability for you to wanna to orange pill everybody. And this was a pretty, I mean, this is Anthony Pompliano. He's a good guy, been you know, a very strong supporter of Bitcoin. And I just want you to listen. This is about 50 seconds or so long about what he says here. Let me make sure you can actually hear this perfectly. Come on in here. Listen to what he says when the host talks about how this is a ridiculous amount of volatility for it to be a store of value. So take a listen. Let me make sure you should hear this. Okay. The volatility on this thing is way too high for anybody to call that a savings account. I mean, you may like it, but I think that's a bridge too far right now, isn't it? Over the last 30 years, the US dollar has lost 50% of its purchasing power. So in my lifetime, $1 now buys you 50% or 50 cents of service and goods. Mm. And so when you think about that, the most volatile asset that most people hold is the dollar and they're on the wrong side of volatility. Bitcoin, on the other hand, over a long period of time appreciates. And so the best statistic to look at this is in 2016, the average median home was about $380,000. I'm sorry, $280,000. Today it's over 400,000, right? So 50% increase in the average home uh, in America. During that same eight year period, it used to cost 664 Bitcoin to buy that home. Today it costs six Bitcoin. It has been a 99% reduction in the cost of a home in America if you held Bitcoin. And so another way to think about that is if you had about $5,000 of Bitcoin in 2016, today it could buy you a house. But depending on the vault. Okay, so that's great. And I like the response, you know, makes a lot of sense. Um, as far as like the depreciation value or the, um, the, the value of the dollar going down 50%, I'm not for sure that's 100% there, but uh, it seems reasonable. I mean, we've all seen that little diagram where you see like uh, the dollar since 1973, pretty much just go down, 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 like, down and to the right, right? But the thing that, that concerns me about is this, is that we're going to, and I want you to really pay attention to this part. I understand where you're gonna have natural thing of like, you should buy, you should buy, you should buy. I did the same thing in 2021, but guess what? In 2022, what happened? Everything took a big dump. So when you're talking about Bitcoin, you're talking about altcoin, just remember to remember some of these rules that I have on here, maybe you, you pick them up or maybe you don't, but I want you to, to remember to tell people, yes, Bitcoin is volatile, Yes, it is great and it's going to change a lot of things, but you have to understand if you're looking for it as like a store of value, it has to be a time frame. And the time frame has to be at minimum. You should at minimum be holding this for four years. You have to say those things. Altcoins, you can say whatever you want. Meme coins, I don't care what you say. But if you're going to say stuff like that and you're going to talk about it, just say, look, to the easiest way to say is just like what Palm said, right? In 20, in 2020, it was 45 Bitcoin to buy a house. And that was the median average price of a house, 328. And it went up 100,000. Was it because the houses became greater? Was it because that everybody made so much more money? Was it because everything just became fantastic? No, it was just because we printed money like crazy. That's the M2 money supply, right? So when we print money, that's what Pomp was talking about. M2 money supply, very simple, right? What I want you to tell people is that this, if you don't hold it for four years, don't bother buying it. Because if you're just buying it to get rich right now, what's going to happen? It's very, it's going to be volatile. It might go up and to the right, but something else could happen. I just want to protect you from you being alienated from your family and friends. Because look, we know it's volatile. We know it can go up. We know it can go down. We know probably it's going to go up pretty well. But if you're going to invest in the Bitcoin, you have to be on your, you have to be on the ball. And if you don't, I don't want you here. So another easier way to say it is what, uh, Jeff Booth said, Jeff Booth is the author of Price of Tomorrow. And he says, it's very simple. If you don't hold Bitcoin, your prices are going up. If you denominate everything in Bitcoin, prices are coming down. It's all you got to say. Just kind of go from there and just say four years. Just do me that favor. Thanks so much. And then also, I, other great news. I hate to bring so much to you because I couldn't find one damn bad article or one bad piece of news out there. Well, maybe one little bit. I'll tell you. This is from Dennis Porter. Good guy, CEO and co-founder of Satoshi Act Fund. And uh, he goes around hobnobbing and talking to all the different uh, legislative powers that are out there and uh, does a good job to pretty much raise awareness for Bitcoin. He says, I can confirm that additional state lawmakers have reached out to me today to request assistance passing a strategic Bitcoin reserve. Think about that. State lawmakers want to put Bitcoin on the books for their particular state in the U.S. 
Tag your state lawmaker if you want to want to stay to join the strategic Bitcoin reserve movements. He says, update, keep tagging. We just had another state lawmaker join the SBR movement. If this is true, which I don't have any reason for Dennis to lie, that's huge. That means that you've got government agencies, state stateside, who are looking to put Bitcoin on their balance sheet. It again, it flabbergasts me why the corporations don't want to put Bitcoin on their balance sheet like MicroStrategy did because they are outpacing everyone. They just passed Ford for Pete's sakes. And all you got to do is put MicroStrategy or put a Bitcoin on your balance sheet. I just don't get it. So if this is actually true, I think it is. This looks pretty darn good. And then also globally, I found this. And as, if we're talking about this, the Bitcoin strategic reserve, this is some China Central TV. China. They report that Trump, this was on their news. Trump has promised to make the U.S. the world's Bitcoin and crypto capital and establish a strategic Bitcoin reserve. There's something going on because this is actually, this is another piece that I picked up from Matthew Siegel, <laughs> recovering CFA. It's funny. Uh, I think he's the uh, one of the lead investors of uh, Van Eck, if I'm not mistaken. Let me see. Head of digital research at Van Eck. That's right. And what he says here is, China unveils a 10 trillion yuan program to help resolve its local government debt crisis as authorities move to shore up a slowing economy facing fresh risks from the re-election of Trump. And I thought to myself, I'm like, maybe this has to do with tariffs. Maybe this has to do with the, the terrible economic situation that China finds it in. Whatever it is, they're going to start dumping and they're going to look for something to actually bolster their effects. So maybe they, and again, remember all those the times, those talks about China banning Bitcoin, and then they actually weren't, and they were actually having the Bitcoin miners over there mining it. Now it all starts to make sense. And then also, because I always worry about this, I'm like, well, then maybe the dollar will just go away. But, you know, as far as like BRICS, this is from Watch Your Guru. EU says it will buy oil from America over Russia because of Trump's win. And then Russia comes out and says it won't ditch the US dollar after Trump's victory. And if that's good, that's what this guy wants. He also wants to put a Bitcoin reserve. Imagine everybody doing that. They're buying oil. And if they're if if you're where to go, if you're buying oil for America, you're not paying for that in rubles. Or you're not paying that in euros. You're paying that in dollars. And then over here, if they're not gonna ditch the dollar, they want to stay on that standard. And they're like, oh, well, America has the res a Bitcoin reserve. They're not gonna beat us. Those those bums, we're going to make sure that we get Bitcoin. And then it just becomes a race, just like what people have been talking about for quite some time. But I will say this, and this is an interesting time frame. Not one day. Let's go six months. This is the US dollar index. And usually what happens, usually, just not now, for some reason, probably because there's so much hype, when the Dixie or the dollar starts to increase in strength, you see the opposite effect for Bitcoin. Bitcoin just hit its all-time highs. So we can see that the dollar, I thought it was below 100, but sure, is now 105. And it's done quite exponentially well since September all the way up to here. I think, let me see what the highest was. Yeah, over in 2022, year after the stock market hit pretty much its all-time high as well. But you can see it had a little bit of a decline, but here we go. So again, the dollar strong, Bitcoin strong, people, countries, nation states are looking at Bitcoin, strategic reserve. I just don't see how we lose here as far as like Bitcoin investors. I could be wrong. Maybe I'm missing something. There's so much good news out there. There's so much natural exuberance. So let me know where I'm incorrect in the comment section and we'll go from there. But I will be remiss if I didn't say this, that Bitcoin is not the whole thing for the markets. It's not. We've got these things called altcoins. And at some point, they're going to start running. And we just saw what happened with Cardano. We just saw what happened with Polygon. We see a lot of things are going on Solana. We shouldn't be able as like investors to take our eye off everything. So we want to kind of keep it a little bit wide. Check this out. Solana, its market cap just crossed Airbnbs. So apparently, two of some of my favorite investments are pretty much neck and neck. That's a lot of money. So congratulations for all you Solana holders. Looks like things are doing pretty well. And then to get to the story about Polygon, why it's ripping at 16% or 14% in 24 hours, PayPal 
backed Magic Labs and Polygon launch a new cross-chain network. They're launching a new cross-chain network called Newton. The platform aims to make using decentralized apps or dApps across multiple blockchains as seamless as browsing the internet. Where have you heard that before? By leveraging Polygon's decentralized ag layer and chain development kit, Newton will devel enable developers to build dApps that operate on different chains without requiring users to keep different wallets. That sounds pretty good. And also one of my other favorite ones, Telegram or Ton. Telegram, which is a messaging app that has 950 million users monthly across the globe, is roughly 8 billion people or so. This was from the BitGet CEO. It's a one-stop app like China's WeChat. According to Gracie Chen, CEO of Exchange and wallet provider BitKit, Telegram's symbiotic relationship with the open network or TUN and its crypto trading features distinguish the app from competitors and positions for massive growth. I think the crypto adoption is definitely something that makes Telegram stand out among other social media. And that's indeed one of the reasons we want to be closer to the open network system. And this is what I've been saying, I don't know how long. This was two months ago. I did a video and just talked about how Telegram was essentially becoming like WeChat, which is essentially a super app. And I said, they're, they already have many apps in there. I think it'll be big. I think it'll do well. Tons in the top 10, I think still, maybe the top 12, but just something to look out for. And then before we go on, I will just say this. Yes, I own Ton. Yes, I own Bitcoin. Yes, I own Solana. Yes, I own Cardano. All the things I just talked about, I own it. And uh, that's as transparent as I can get. And lastly, something I need to talk about, which was this. Adam John said, meld rugged. Robbie, you got that meld behind you still. And you can see it. There's, a, uh, there's an icon right there. And that's the meld icon. And meld was a project that I invested into. We did a couple of videos out, matter of fact. We had Oleg on. And um, oh, hold on real quick. Oh, that's why. We had Ken Oleg, not Oleg. We had Ken on, and we talked about this uh, for a couple of times. And yesterday, people were saying, hey, the price of, let me pull this up. I don't know why I have this here. Mel. The price of Mel was down 60, well, it went from this, I don't care about volume. It was down over 70% now, as of 12%. Let's see, how are we? Seven days, 82%, 14, one year is still down 84%. And we're in a massive bull run. And uh, I said, well, maybe there's something going on, there's a conversion or something. And during that live stream, I reached out to Ken who was, who is the founder. And I said, and I'll read this to you guys again. Hey, I said, hey, what's going on with the price action of meld conversion? And he says there was, and this is all public knowledge, so it's fine. He said there was three wallet whales that dumped hard on us two weeks ago. Two VCs that were investing got cold feet, pulled out at last minutes. I've spent the past week trying to get new investors, but none moved that fast. We've been forced to lay off the staff and wind down on December 31st. We talked about this yesterday. And I said explicitly, well, if you want to get out, this would probably be the time. I've been trying to get investors for 60 months, zero interest in real projects, only meme coins, pre-TGE to pre tokens. We were across the line for more than a month, but these three whale, whale wallets dropped the price by 40 in a week. VC pulled out for that. I spent the past week trying to get new VCs with no luck. No one can move that fast. I said, hey, can I say this or not? He said, yeah, it's public. Go right ahead. And that's where we're at with that one. And last night I was thinking about it and I thought to myself, well, I need to change this. I need to change this background because that's meld right there. You know, and then of course in there, there's Bitcoin, all that stuff that's behind me. But I said, no, I'm going to leave it. And I'll leave it because of this, because these companies, these crypto products that are out there, you're gambling. You're all investors. These things are bound to happen. Nothing will go up 100% of the time. So every time that you think that this is a sure thing, I want you to look up at this right here. And I want you to see this just like I see it and just go, shoot, nothing is guaranteed. Maybe I should 
take a look at these rules behind, uh, below Rob and kind of incorporate that. And one of the biggest rule, number five, is take profits along the way. And the other big rule is everything's a scam until pure otherwise. Now, I don't think that Meld was a scam. I don't think it was a rug pull. I think it was that this company or this, that's not a company. They've been trying to make this work for two years. They just got a money transmitter license in the EU to become a neo bank across 163 uh, different areas. And they were going forward and it didn't work. So my investment is gone. Your investment is gone. And that's what we're doing here. And uh, if this is something that you think that is not for you, then you should stop investing. And that's it. Let me know if you like today's video. If you like today's video, give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing. I'm going to talk about it. It's time sensitive. Now, if you're interested, we'll do a little Q&A. Answer all your questions to the best of my abilities. And then also, shh, if you want to come talk my ear off, uh, last night over at the uh, smokehouse, we weren't able to uh, go because uh, the electricity goes out, which happens sometimes in Puerto Rico. But it's going on right now tonight at in the next 20 minutes. So I need to get going. But uh, if you want to come by, I'll be there by the first round of beers. And Steve and the owner buys the second round.